Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to this session. I hope not a lot of you got confused with the track and the theme. So I don't know if you read, there was a brief description in the uh, talk that this session will talk uh, in several tracks, uh, PM development. It's a, it is a case study, but uh, there are some code elements in it and also a little bit of the context about the mission uh, for USA. Uh, for this presentation, uh, Charlie and myself will give you a little bit of the introduction to what this project was and is right now, and we'll go into a little bit of the details. Um, and again, thank you very much for choosing this session. Uh, so I'll start with um, presenting myself. So my name is Gerardo. I am a technical architect at Pixel. I've been working there for a little bit more than three years now. Um, I've had the opportunity to work in a lot of very cool projects like this one and many others. I've been doing Drupal for about seven years. Um, I've been doing other technologies also around Drupal and that probably fall far from Drupal, but every, every, every time it's something like Drupal related uh, from uh, seven years now. And I'm mainly a PHP and a JavaScript developer. Um, I started obviously with uh, PHP when I started with Drupal, and I've been learning JavaScript and, and different front-end frameworks as well. Um, hey, everybody. My name is Charlie Turner. Uh, I am the web strategist at Pano Gore Group. Uh, I work on a USAID funded project that I'll be telling you all a little bit more about in a few minutes. Um, but I've been working on USAID funded Drupal sites for about five years. Um, prior to that, my background is largely in digital marketing, uh, more traditional communications, um, and kind of a, a broad digital communication spectrum. Um, so it's my first time at Drupal GovCon, and I'm really excited to be here, um, and even more excited to be. Uh, here presenting with uh, Gerardo and Bixel, who were uh, outstanding partners on uh, the project we'll be telling you about today. So let's dive right in. Uh, just out of curiosity, because I know there's a pretty wide variety of people who have worked with the government in different capacities here. Has anyone in this audience uh, worked uh, on a USAID program or contract? Handful of people. Everyone from Pixel's raising their hand. All right. Hi, <laughs> um, Awesome. And what about uh, specifically in family planning? Is anyone familiar with family planning programs? Pixel, yeah. Oh. I'll raise your hand. <laughs> awesome. Well, we'll hopefully give you a little bit of a rundown today on on what that means when I talk about this stuff. Um, so uh, I want to kick it off first, though, by telling you a little bit about the initiative that I work on. So I told you I work for Panagora Group, and we are a contractor, a subcontractor, on an initiative called the USAID Global Health Supply Chain Program Procurement and Supply Management Project. It's really catchy. <laughs> uh, and because it's so catchy, I'm going to refer to it as GHSC PSM for the rest <laughs> of this presentation, which is you know, marginally better. Um, but to give you an idea of what this project is, it is the largest international development project ever funded by USAID. And as you may have guessed from the name of it, we manage global health supply chains. Uh, we purchase commodities, we deliver commodities, and we work with uh, in-country governments to shore up their domestic supply chains. So the project is really broken into three pieces. Uh, the first being, as I just mentioned, the global supply chain. Uh, that means that we work with manufacturers uh, to purchase things like uh, malaria bed nets, uh, antiretroviral treatments for HIV and AIDS, uh, contraceptives, Zika prevention, and so on. Uh, and then we manage the logistics processes and the global shipping and the customs getting them into the developing countries that need those commodities. The other half of that coin is, I think, really probably the most interesting part of the work we do, which is our country programs bit. Uh, we also call it system strengthening. Um, that's where we work 
out of our 33 different country offices with domestic governments to shore up their domestic supply chain. So once we have those commodities in country, we help ministries of health and uh, in-country partners actually get those commodities to the people that need them the most. Uh, a lot of times that means rural populations who might not be able to access uh, things as simple as you know, malaria prevention uh, in areas that have a uh, high risk for malaria. Uh, it might be uh, HIV patients uh, being able to get you know, reliable supplies of antiretrovirals. You know, that's really sort of some of the most critical stuff that we do. Uh, and then the third piece up here, which I'll mention briefly, is global collaboration. And that's just to say that you know, none of this work is done on our own. Uh, we work with global partners. We work with other donors to make sure everything is done as efficiently and as effectively as possible. No, whoops, wrong one. Um, so I mentioned that we work in supply chains. And this presentation will be looking specifically at our work in reproductive health and specifically contraceptives. Uh, I like to say that we are where the rubbers meet the road. <laughs> yep. Um, joking, joking aside, I've always wanted to use that line. <laughs> joking aside, uh, I love this picture. This was a picture we got recently out of a video we shot in Rwanda. And it's a picture of a nurse named Janine Munyana. And she's working with this client and showing her different options for contraception. Um, and you know, I told you a lot about our work in supply chain just now, but this is really, really sort of the, the end result of our work. Because without strong supply chains, without the support of donors like USAID um, and others, nurses like Janine and her client wouldn't have reliable access to these kinds of things, especially the kinds of things that we take for granted. So, I think this picture does a great job of really capturing the gravity and the importance of the work that USAID is doing in this space. Why is family planning important? Um, I think in the scope of international development, sometimes family planning is kind of yada yada at the end of the discussion. but. In reality, it's one of the most effective and most important pieces of what we do. Uh, there are more than 214 million women with an unmet need for family planning in the world. Every $1 spent on family planning saves between $2 and $6 in costs. If all unmet need for modern contraception was met in developing regions, there would be approximately a three-quarters decline in unintended pregnancies. Lastly, fully meeting the unmet need for modern contraception would result in an estimated 76,000 fewer maternal deaths each year. So, you know, it's not just providing convenience for people. It's not just, you know, uh, making people's lives a little bit better. It really is about saving people's lives, making sure that communities are healthy, that people can plan their families effectively, that they can plan their families safely, and that they can really kind of control their own destinies. Um, now, within family planning, we talk a lot about a concept called contraceptive security, and I promise we're going to get to Drupal in a second here. <laughs> um, contraceptive security is the state where every person is able to choose, obtain, and use quality contraception and other essential reproductive health products whenever they need them. So that means that it's not just um, about having you know a single option or you know, whatever's convenient. It's about having options and being able to sort of effectively plan and choose what you need. Uh, and when we talk about contraception, we talk about a number of different methods. These are just a few of them, but you know, this includes things like oral contraception, the pill, um, intrauterine devices, probably usually more often referred to as IUDs, uh, male condoms, female condoms, implants, and there's a few other methods that are pretty popular as well. Um, but I just kind of want to give you the context and the background of what we're talking about here. Um, we do call this variety the range of options that are available in a different country. We refer to it as the method mix. Uh, and this is a really important piece of contraceptive security. Um, providing a mix of contraceptions is essential to ensuring that clients can choose the contraception that best fits their needs. So, for example, some uh, women or couples might want something that's temporary. You know, maybe they just had a child and they want to wait, 
you know, to space the birth until their next one. And so they don't want to necessarily go with something like an implant or an IUD, but they need something a little more temporary. Uh, in other cases, it might be something that people want to hold off indefinitely, and you'll find more effective options for that. So the method mix is really important in order to provide women and couples, you know, the uh, most flexibility and the most reliable options for, uh, for their future. Uh, so again, I've talked about supply chains, I've talked a little bit about the availability of, availability of method mixes, but just having the commodities in country isn't always enough. Um, and that's a really important theme that we're going to touch on and why the work that we did with this dashboard that we'll talk about in a minute is so important is because it might be the case that you have options in the country, but they're not always available to different people. There's a lot of different pieces that go into contraceptive security. So for example, in Bangladesh, young people and unmarried people are not allowed to receive contraception from public health facilities. So I mean, that's really something if you think about it. I mean, certainly young people in Bangladesh could use contraception, but if they're not able to get it, that affects the contraceptive security in that country. Similarly, in Zimbabwe, contraceptives can't be sold to people under the age of 18. Literally can't be sold to them. So again, the, it might be that the commodities are there, but they're not always accessible to especially vulnerable populations like youth. And these are just the two examples. Um, and, and what that really means is that when we talk about contraceptive security, we need to talk about it in the context of a holistic view. It's not just the commodities being in the country, it's about how accessible the commodities are to the people that are gonna need them the most. Um, and that was the question that USAID asked back in 2009, uh, when they launched what's called the Contraceptive Security Indicators Survey. Uh, this was a survey that looks at things like supply chain capacity, it looks at spending, it looks at stock levels, uh, but it also looks at things like government policies, uh, informal policies, uh, local customs. It takes a holistic view of contraceptive security. Um, and the data would be used by a number, a pretty wide variety of different actors. So uh, critically, ministries of health, again, the sort of in-country government bodies that try to shore up contraceptive security in their own country, they need to know where they need to throw money, and they usually don't have a lot of money to move around, so they really want to make sure they're focusing in the best places. It's used by international donors like USAID to decide you know, which countries need help more than others. Um, it's used by uh, implementing partners that work with international donors to actually implement reproductive health programs. And then lastly, it's also used by the private sector. Uh, if you are a manufacturer or a distributor of contraceptives and you want to move into a new market, understanding the situation in different developing countries can be really helpful to understanding how to approach that market. And so that was sort of the audience for this survey and the indicators that came out of it. Um, and so the survey looked at 36 different countries uh, through key informant interviews and uh, quantitative reports from the domestic and global supply chains. And what they ended up producing was uh, effectively this enormous spreadsheet with all the indicators, all the stats related to those indicators on it. Um, this information was shared primarily through this venue, and they also had a number of you know, brochures and handouts and one-pagers, and sort of your traditional collateral to uh, show this off. This was done by uh, a previous USAID project called the Deliver Project that you may be familiar with. Um, Deliver closed out in 2016, and the project I work on now inherited the responsibility for the Contraceptive Security Indicator Survey. So it was our job to, again, figure out how countries are performing uh, in terms of contraceptive security, and then how, and figure out a way that we're gonna disseminate this information to the people that need it, to those parties. And this is where we came to Bixel, because we knew that we wanted to share this data, and we knew that it was really important, but we wanted a better way to distribute it, and we wanted a better way to communicate it, to make sure that everyone who needed it could access it. And so the idea was, they would come up with a dashboard. Um, it would allow anyone anywhere to access this data instantaneously. We could update it whenever we wanted. And moreover, year to year, or biannually as it turns out, 
we could update the data and not have to distribute new collateral each time we did it. So it really provides a lot of advantages and we found it to be very, very successful. Um, so I'd like to hand over the presentation now to Gerardo who will uh, tell you a little bit about the, uh, or a lot about the uh, nuts and bolts of developing the <laughs> yeah. dashboard. Uh, thank you, Charlie. No, thank you very much. It was a very uh, good context. Um, so yeah, now I want to talk a little bit more about Drupal and decoupling Drupal to facilitate and to provide uh, the target audience that Charlie and USAID have for this particular effort. So before, before I go into this, how many of you here in the audience are developers? Okay, and how many of you do other things like pro pro project management or uh, handle, okay, so it's a good mix. So um, before, before going too much into this, the other thing that is important to uh, mention is that Bixel was also involved in the original development for the website for GHSC, for the global health supply chain. So we did that effort initially and we went through a facelift phase as well. And that's, that's also a little bit of why we had this relationship even though this project or this particular product was way more ambitious than just a website. Um, so kind of like the, the, a very basic problem definition for this enhanced part was uh, to create this interactive dashboard to be displayed on the current website uh, that would allow users to interact with the survey data collected on these 36 countries. Um, when we were taking a look at this, and this is obviously a very simplified version of the problem, um, you can almost see a few, key, few keywords here that would probably uh, and eventually told us that this was something else than just Drupal. Um, so one of those keywords here are obviously interactive charting uh, the, on the current website and data, right? So. Uh, continuing with that process, uh, kind of like when we're saying something about interactive charting, what comes to mind right now is, well, we need some sort of JavaScript library on the front end to make this more uh, reactive, more dynamic, and not as, as static as Drupal. Well, you could also be dynamic with Drupal, but it's way harder. Um, on the current website that we developed and we knew that it was Drupal 8, uh, so we had that to our advantage because it was not a uh, strange technology, not for um, our client and not for us because, again, we've been doing Drupal for a long time and we developed the original website. And the last part was the data. This was something very different in terms that these data was not coming from content types or from content on our website. This data was coming from another source of data that uh, they were providing us via this file. And I will talk a little bit more about that, but it was not something that lived inside of Drupal. So how do we make it that, that information to live inside of Drupal and, and that we can also maintain it and update it and do all that? Um, so here are a little bit uh, more like specific requirements for this. So uh, we needed to, a way to embed this dashboard in the current website. Um, it had to be interactive. Uh, it could not only be, since there is a lot of information, it would be very hard to display everything at once. So we needed some way to let the users pick and choose and even filter some of that data to make it more understandable. Uh, for them. Um, so there, there was also a requirement to update that data or if something was wrong that came originally through the survey and the aggregation had some issues and we needed to provide also a way to quickly update that information. Um, obviously transform the Excel file but that at the end is just a Microsoft S Excel file and what how do we do all that to put it into Drupal in such a way that we can maintain it and consume it from these apps? 
um, style the application since this was something uh, that was going to be outside of Drupal, it needed to look like it was part of the same experience and part of the same website and portal. And the last one, it was a quick turnaround. And I know this is probably very familiar to a lot of us where we just need to do something very complex, very cool in a limited amount of time. So those were kind of like the specific requirements that we were working uh, with. Uh, this next slide, uh, Charlie had a slide also with a little bit of this. And this is just for you to give, to give you an idea of the end product. Uh, since I'm going to be referencing and I'm going to be talking about a dashboard and you might not be uh, that familiar to know what dashboard am I referring to. So this is it and we will explore it and play with it uh, at the end but just for you to have that picture in the back of your head as I go and talk through how do we achieve this inside of Drupal. Um, so first of all, uh, one of the things that we were uh, doing a little bit of discovery at the beginning is, do we really need to decouple this? Is this something that we really need to put outside of Drupal and then embedded it? Um, so uh, there, as you might know, there are different ways to decouple Drupal. Um, four, four of the main ones are just like a coupled Drupal or a monolithic approach, which is just using Drupal for everything, for the display of data, the uh, content editor experience, so everything in Drupal. So that's not even decoupling. Uh, progressively decoupled is we are using a lot of Drupal to display most of the static information on the site. But whenever we need a little bit more of interactivity or something like a web app or something that we want to enhance the experience, we would just inject those apps into certain regions of our Drupal website. Um, fully decoupled static site, this is something that is uh, very hot these days and very trending using Jam stacks, JavaScript API markdown stacks. Uh, this is when you have a Drupal backend and you have a Gatsby in the front or a Jekyll or something that statically generates uh, markdown files based on the content that you have. So this is very trendy and there are a lot of benefits to it, and there are a few trade-offs as well. Um, that, that was clearly not the way in which we wanted to go. And then a fully decouple that, which uh, this means when you really need to decouple everything and use uh, technologies like Next.js with React, or just a, uh, an SPA uh, that you don't really need anything that Drupal, anything uh, that Drupal does in terms of rendering the information on the display. Um, it also comes to what are you trying to build, right? So is it a stand uh, a standalone website? Do you need multiple web experiences um, or multiple non-web experiences, right? Like uh, with uh, voice assistants or some other integrations that you might be doing now with phones and watches and all that. Or maybe you have a mix between those, right? So that these are some of the questions that you can ask yourself to see if you need to decouple and how can you decouple it. Um, this is a quick um, chart that I took from a blog by Dries uh, where he talks about uh, decoupling and he has a few diagrams that you can follow and I thought this was very interesting when he takes this approach about the editorial needs and the developer needs, and he pretty much categorized this, categorized those in this, uh, in this chart, and it, it has a title at the top that says, are there things that you cannot live without? And then you go through the chart and see which ones are the features that are, that are very important to you, and then that helps you to make a, a more informed de decision. Um, the thing that I think that is missing here, and it's also very important for you to decide if you should decouple or not, is your team, right? Uh, what if you only have only one developer working on this? Um, he better be like a unicorn because he would need to know a lot about DevOps, master Drupal 8 on the back end and the front end, and then master a front end technology like React or Angular or Vue. So, um, they exist, 
but it is often rare and you also have the time constraint, right? So it's not something that only one developer can take typically. Um, you might also have a small team or, or of very specialized Drupal developers. And if this is the case, and if they only specialize in Drupal, it probably will take some time for some of them to go out and learn another technology and learn how to integrate that into Drupal to be able to make something like this. And the best case scenario for this, if you have been to the couple and you've identified that your team also has a very good mix for, with developers with different specializations for Drupal, for JavaScript and front-end technologies, then you are better set up to go decoupling something, even if it's only progressively decoupled. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about charting technologies. And this is also very complex in terms that there is just too much stuff out there and it's hard sometimes to even know what to start looking, when to st or where to start. Um, I did a quick uh, search on GitHub for the word chart, and I chose one of the facets to be JavaScript, the JavaScript language, for projects that had more than 200 stars, where that, that was completely arbitrary, but I think if it has 200 stars, maybe there's some traction and it's maintained somehow. And I found 168 repositories for doing something like this. Um, that is a lot. And the, one of the things that we need to start taking a look when you have this amount of projects and technologies is, is where do I even start to, to start exploring these technologies that I might need. So we were kind of looking a little bit like this. So where, where, do, where do we even start with this? It's just too much. Um, we were able to uh, filter it down to a few of them that we uh, knew after uh, reading about a little bit of these technologies, the ones that get used the most and the ones that are more, like, more maintained and more supported. There is even one module for Drupal 8 that helps you with charting. Um, it depends a lot on views, so if your project has a need, then that might be a good uh, solution for your project. In our case, we were not using views at all, because again, the, this data is coming from somewhere else that is not even Drupal. So we could have probably converted, but that was a lot of probably effort to just maintain that in, in that way. So these are like a few more examples um, that for or a more filtered filter down list of charting projects. And then how, how do we even choose one that might work for, for us and that we can probably reuse on other projects as a company, right? So one of the things that we can start taking a look at is if the pro project is well documented and if there are examples, um, how active is the project? Uh, is the project free or commercially licensed? Like there is a very, very cool charting technology that is called high charts and it's very cool and it does a lot of things but there if you want to use it uh, professionally then you need to pay a license and those are kind of like the things that you need to start evaluating and just reading about these frameworks to uh, measure the one that that you might end up using um, how easy are they to customize because it, it will be very rare that what you find in the project you can just take it and put it into your project uh, there will be always little tweaks and little things that you need to account for and how easy is to do that. Um, the last one is if you've already chosen a, a JavaScript framework, then does this char charting library works well with that? Do you need to do a lot of work to put it into that? Um, in our particular case, uh, at this point of this project, we've already had a couple of people in Big Cell that were very uh, experienced with React. Um, some, of, some of us had already done uh, a few projects with it, so we felt comfortable with it. So, and that's the way in which we uh, went with this. So we were looking for something even more specialized, a charting library that would work well with React. Um, and just as a, a quick example of the one that we chose is this one. It, it, it has a very uh, weird name, it's called Recharts. 
And the, as you can see here, it, it is well documented. Uh, there are instructions like, and guides to how do you even install it, how do you use it. And one of the coolest things that they do is that they do have an examples um, part on their website where you can actually see a lot of these charts that they provide, like kind of like out of the box. And on the right, you have the code for that chart. So even if you want to start experiment, experimenting right there in your browser, you can just go in there and change the code and change the values and see how that would react there. So you can quickly assess if something like this is going to fulfill your needs to do these kind of like visualizations and, and charting options that you might need. Uh, so this is just a quick example and uh, this is the one that we actually end up using and implementing. Um, obviously we customize it to look and feel like um, the main theme on the website and we did a, a few more customizations but nothing too hard to do with this. Um, the next part was the data handling, right? So we know that uh, Charlie already uh, showed like a, a little example of these big spreadsheets that uh, is just the aggregated data from these surveys that are being handled in uh, 36 countries. So this is a lot of information. So how do you, how do we even start processing something like this in Drupal? Um, I don't know if there is something like um, out of the box that could do this. I, I don't think that there is something like super out of the box that you can use. Um, the reason for that is because um, the files themselves, the structures of each Excel file will, be, will be different. So it's very hard to know exactly how do you want to parse that information and take it for you. Um, there, there is a, a very cool PHP library that is called PHP Spreadsheet, which it is very well documented. Uh, this library comes from the formerly known as PHP Office library that got deprecated and then they started doing uh, specialized libraries for each Microsoft Office product. Uh, it is a very cool library. It is outside of Drupal, however, this is uh, going outside of the Drupal island to go and get something uh, from PHP and be able to use it um, inside of Drupal. So for those of you who are familiar with installing modules in Drupal 8, um, it is very easy to install it at a code base level uh, using Composer because you can just run that Composer require uh, line that I have there and it would, you would get the code for that. The only thing that is not there is the integration with Drupal, and that's kind of like the custom work that you need to do. However, it's, it is very easy, at least the initial setup, and I'm gonna show it to you, just for you to have an idea of how do we even started doing the parsing and the processing for this. And that last line that I have there is something that the PHP spreadsheet library offers. It is, uh, you can run the PHP web server uh, with one of their folders that they have. They have a lot of samples that you can even change the code almost in real time and you'll see uh, there are a lot of examples to read and to write um, Excel files. So if you have this need and you are interested in doing something like this, I highly recommend you take a, you, that you take a look at this library. Um, so how do we even start integrating something that is not even made originally for Drupal, but is more abstract? Um, and it's very easy. So after you've installed the library with Composer, then you have the, the autoloader already knows the class name, and you can just embed the, the class name plus the namespace that all comes from Composer. So you start creating your new module, and this is one of the first lines that you're module will have. In this particular case, for, for this project, we created a service that uses the uh, PHP spreadsheet library so we can reuse it in different places for on, on the site. But the implementation can be more specialized and you might not need a service, it's just the way in which we implemented it. 
And then it, it is very easy to use. You just create a new rated object from the, that class, and that object has methods to read and to write uh, Excel spreadsheets. And this is very well documented on the documentation for this library. So I just have here like a quick example in terms of how do you even create a reader object and how do you create like a spreadsheet variable that will hold all the data that you are getting from these files. Um, obviously the second part that, it, that is not here and it's the complicated part is the parsing, right? Because you need to make, you need to make some sense of the, of the actual data to start thinking of your data architecture because now you also have the other constraint, right? What is the format that I need to use so my charting library can read that and we can interact with that and change that probably a little bit in real time because we want it to be dynamic and interactive. So that part is very complex and is very long. Uh, the way in which we parse and the way in which we, the way in which we transform that initial Excel spreadsheet into JSON objects that we can use on the apps. Um, but that is kind of like the step that would follow. Um, and then lastly, um, one of the things that we were analyzing and discover is maybe we can get all this into Drupal and just expose it uh, with an API or even through REST or, or even using GraphQL, uh, which are uh, JSON API or the GraphQL module for Drupal 8 work um, very well now. So we could have gone that way. Um, the issue with that is that it, it was going to be harder to maintain the data itself because it would require uh, the people who are maintaining the data to know all that structure in Drupal. And they already know the, the spreadsheet, so why, do, why would we need to change that structure that they already know? and that they are comfortable working with. And the other thing is that if we were just to create those files and host them into our Drupal instance, we also would be saving on query time, right? Because we just have a, this data is not changing every day or every hour, it is a little bit more static. So we can just create those files and those structures and host them on our file or on our website and then the app, the React app, can just go and grab them and do all the magic on the browser and on the front end. So we are saving a lot of processing on the web server, and all the processing is being deferred to the browser. So there is also a gain there, and this is why in this particular case, we chose to go uh, for not using an API and just use the, this new JSON structure as static files. Um, there is, and I, we are just saving them on the files uh, folder for Drupal. Um, you can even go to the main site and these are the files, so they're no different than any other image or any other asset on the Drupal website. Again, this information, it is public, it's just kind of like uh, harder to see, and I, w I can show you the structure so you can see the difference between um, the Excel spreadsheet data and what does it look like now on a JSON data structure. So to get to this point, obviously there is a lot of data architecture that we had to do in terms of thinking, okay, this is the data that is coming from the Excel spreadsheet and this is the format that we need on the charts. So there is a lot of things here for the data we added the kind of charts that we wanted to be creating, uh, names and blurbs, that all these data gets uh, consumed into the dashboard. Uh, so these files might seem a little bit big. They're not that big in terms of size. Uh, I, their images are way, way bigger, bigger than this. So even the trade-off that we would get to just to get everything at once is not that much, it, and the impact is not um, hi. Also, this file is also getting cached on the CDN, so it's not even requested every time from the server. It is getting requested from the CDN, so there is also another saving there that, that we did with this um, architecture. So just to give you an idea, <clears throat> this is what happens after we run the parser and we process the Excel spreadsheet. This is how the data looks now 
so we can consume it on, on the dashboard. Um, Um, we also created this little tool utility on Drupal just to upload new Excel spreadsheet files that would have the same structure but might have different data. So whenever uh, our client needed to just refresh that data or, or update that information, the only thing that they need to do as admins in Drupal is just go here to this custom uh, admin page that we created and re-upload the file. When they do that, then the process runs again and the files get recreated and then those files get used eventually in the, the dashboard application. Um, so with, with all that, what uh, this means is that now we have a progressive decoupled architecture, right? So the way in which we are embedding this dashboard into Drupal is in this particular case by doing or by choosing a block and that blog just injects the application there with the HTML IDs that needs to have. That's pretty much how it works. Um, there's also the compiling it and doing all that, but at the end it just gets injected into a page using a blog. Um, this is the uh, website right now. Uh, another important thing after doing this is how do we integrate it so the experience for users is uh, coherent and cohesive with the rest of the site that we already have. So this is the uh, homepage for, for the website. And a little bit down, uh, we created this call out for users to see this new application that is the, the contraceptive security, uh, excuse me, indicators dashboard. So. Basically, the only thing that this does is when you click it, then you go to this page that has this Drupal block that injects a React application. Um, yeah, so I am going to do a quick um, walkthrough for this, just so you can see a little bit of the interactive elements that the dashboard has. Um, this, this is basically a dashboard. This is all built on React on top of Drupal. Uh, there is this first map that you have here is to see uh, individual country data uh, for each country, which changes this. I guess the resolution is uh, very kind of low here, but we, we can work with this. Uh, the initial dashboard that you see, if you don't choose any country, is the dashboard for all of the aggregated data. Um, so there are different, a lot of indicators, different visualizations, and different options that you can choose. Uh, this is just one indicator that we have for this particular topic. Um, but as you uh, choose other indicators, as you see, all of this is reactive. We're not reloading uh, the page for Drupal because this is being handled by the React application. And there, there are also one of the other cool things that we were able to implement is a filtering option here, right? So depending on the options that, you, that each chart has, you can pick and choose um, if you're just interested in, in seeing a couple and compare them, for example. There are other indicators are country-based, so you might want to uh, compare two different countries for, for a particular indicator and see how they compare each other or doing something more, uh, some other things that users might want to filter out and make sense of these data in a much, much cleaner and better way than just having a Excel spreadsheet. Uh, so this is kind of like the end product. Again, there, is a, there are a lot of indicators we used a lot of different charts that the, um, the library had. Um, some of these we had to customize it a little bit, but it, all this was within the, the scope of the time and that we wanted to do. Um, so yeah, as you can see, there are tables, there are charts. It is a very complex dashboard, but at the same time, it's uh, user-friendly, it's usable. 
Um, our UX team was also very involved in this and they did a great job in terms of just figuring out how the experience should work and how everything would be uh, of better use for, for our end users. Um, yeah, so um, a few lessons learned that we had with this were just like, it is very important to discuss all the details, particularly with very complex uh, visualizations, uh, and what level of interactivity you need for each chart. Um, even though we are not necessarily data scientists, it is always very good to have a very good understanding of all of the data and how it is working and what kind of outcome do we want to provide. Um, responsiveness can be tricky. Uh, that could be part of your chart library as well. In this case, it was kind of there, so we just had to customize it. And if you have 508 requirements, that's also very complicated to do with visualization, so you might end up uh, choosing another approach, like putting everything in a format that is compatible with screen readers, because all this is very hard to just make it fiber comp compliance, but you, there's always a way to provide an accessible way to this information. So explore those and, and just be, be sure that you are considering everything that your project requires. Um, it's a few references for a couple of slides that, that we had there. And questions. We're also hiring, so that's the Pixel website for careers if you're interested. And do you have any questions? Yes? Uh, what is the, um, where's the app? The React app? What is it there? You kind of, kind of glanced over that a little bit. Where, is, where does it, is that on a separate server? Is that inside? No. Is so the, the, the app gets compiled every time that we do a modification to it. So it's basically, we're just including that as a library for the module, and it lives inside of Drupal. It's it lives just, inside the module. yeah, it lives inside the module. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Following up on that, I know we wrote our own web pack at one point. It's yep. very complicated and hard. I know there's a community web pack. What is the easiest way to pack React apps into Drupal in 2019? That is a very good question. So the way in which we had to do it is that we, had, we were using the Create React App starting thing, and you need to eject it because with, what happens with that is that every time that you build it, the file name changes. And we need a file name that persists so we can reference it in the blog. So we had to eject that and change the web pack a little bit just that that would persist. And we also added a few customizations. There is a module that got presented on Drupal Decouple Days last year that is called uh, Drupal Web App, and basically lets you do something like this. Uh, at the time, it was kind of new, so we did not use it, but I think that right now is better. So that's a good thing to explore. I've had some success in a OK, yeah, it, it's always hard. Yeah. <laughs> This one? Any other questions? If not, feel free to reach out. And thank you. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you very much.